Hello, and thank you for joining us for API Legal Outreach's Rebuilding the Dream Campaign. You know, we have over the past few weeks tried to present conversations that really reflect the core values of API Legal Outreach programs that talked about prevention of violence against women, gender-based violence, uh, conversations around the survival of our ethnic and immigrant communities. And tonight we're pleased to present a conversation uh, covering the struggle for racial justice, especially in the Bay Area. This campaign is uh, presented in a difficult fundraising year for all nonprofits. Uh, it's been difficult for everyone in, uh, in, the, in the world with the pandemic, uh, but it's particularly, I think, difficult for those who are struggling with employment and uh, nonprofits that are struggling to obtain funding uh, because of the lack of public monies uh, and, the, and the expectation that the economies are going to be slow in recovering. Uh, we are asking through this campaign to, uh, for you to consider uh, donations to our services. Um, we are not able to pro provide our annual gala or fundraising events this year, uh, but we also wanted to cover some important issues uh, that were critical to our communities um, through these conversations. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, tonight, we're going to be joined by James Bell, an old friend, uh, someone that uh, is a lifelong advocate for social and racial justice. Um, a reminder that we will be uh, taking uh, live questions uh, toward the end of the program. The first part of the program, because of James's uh, scheduling, uh, will be recorded, but we will come back to you very shortly live and uh, take on uh, questions and, and provide some conversation. Let's get started with James. Um, and we'll re be right back with you with some live conversation. Welcome and good evening. Thanks for joining us with our uh, third in a series of conversations, part of the API Legal Outreach Building the Dream Campaign. Uh, tonight, we are talking about uh, racial justice issues and I am more than pleased and honored to welcome James Bell our conversation. James is the founder and president of the W. Hayward Burns Institute. James is well known internationally, is a superstar of racial justice advocacy and the reform of youth justice systems. Thank you, James, for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to see you again, and uh, thanks for joining us in this conversation. Um, James, I mean, you've done so much in the field uh, of uh, youth justice reform. Um, and we first met probably in college, uh, worked together in the Western edition. Um, what what motivated you to, to, to continue on with this work? So thank you so much, Dean, um, uh, for asking me to be a part of this conversation. It's an important conversation, I think, in San Francisco at this time. And what motivated me to do this work was always trying to represent um, poor people and people of color in their aspirations for equity in um, San Francisco, the state of California, and other places. And it basically just started with growing up and seeing what was happening around, seeing what people were um, protected from harm and which people were subject to abuse and thinking about how unfair that was that certain people that were doing um, certain acts were protected and other people that were doing similar acts weren't protected. And so it's just, just a sense of basic fairness and um, part of that, of course, was even the opportunities that were given to us um, in our generation around affirmative action. 
that um, people in public schools that were seen as okay, but not um, functioning greatly um, to be able to compete, to go to college, and then to go on beyond college to um, post-secondary um, and professional schools um, was something that was a great help um, to those of us that um, were given an equal opportunity. And once we got to those places that we found that we could compete as well with those with people who had financial and other economic advantages. So um, my whole career, um, has, as has been your career, has just been trying about leveling the playing field in a place that um, tries to deny that the field is level. And our job is to keep making it level for those who, so that everyone has an opportunity. You know, you and I are, are children of performative action and studies, something that I don't think people today really appreciate. The fact that, um, you know, when we were in law school, I, I know for my class, at least one quarter of the class were students of color. And, uh, you know, at least maybe 20 uh, to 25 students who were African American, eight and 25 to 30 students are Asian, 25 to 30 students were Latino. Um, but today, uh, you look at these law school, law school classes, and there are very few students of color. And I'm discounting a little bit Asians that are trying to make it on their academic kind of scores. But uh, if you look at the courts today, the advocates that we need, uh, there are very few. Uh, Black Americans and Latinx uh, attorneys that are being uh, allowed the opportunity uh, to get a legal, e legal education and get licensed to practice. It, it's just a, a, tra a tragedy to me. And as we, you know, we, we just talked about a, a mutual friend who had, had, has retired. As we start to leave the field, I, I'm worried that uh, there aren't too many bodies to replace us. Right, and that's a totally legitimate um, worry because not only at law school and medical school and any of the postgraduate programs, even in college and university themselves. I mean, it has become that community college is where you find most people of color because of the economic and academic hurdles that are put in the way. And um, the Asian American community has learned that by achieving academically and doing what you can to do that, that that tries to even the playing field so that you can't be denied based on your academic um, um, achievements. But each culture, even ethnicity has a different journey in the American experience. Black folks have a different journey from Asian Americans and Native Americans and Latinx folks. And so each ethnicity has to have its journey and what affirmative action was trying to do was to actually accommodate those journeys and give the young people, the children of those parents and those people that were in America trying to make it um, a better chance. I can remember in high school saying, why is it that we can't read about different cultures? Why do we have to keep reading The Great Gatsby and these kind of American um, novels and not read about the people that I see around me. Um, so why is it that we can't um, read about indigenous people and African Americans? And so we had to strike and walk out. Affirmative action wasn't given. It was something that we worked very hard to be able to see ourselves in the curriculum. And so now we have, you know, writers that are recognized as having said something um, in these different ethnicities. And so it's no doubt in my mind that in fact, those that are the gatekeepers of power are not going to want to have um, um, more equity and equal voices. But this is a fact that can't be denied. Three years ago, I think the graduating class in high school three years ago in 2017 was the last high school class that was going to be majority white. 
So 2018, 2019, the majority of high school graduates are people of color. And at some point, they're going to demand a curriculum that meets their needs and, and looks like them. And similarly, last year was the first year that the most baby bo babies born in this country were young people, were babies of color. And so these demographics are not going away. And um, this notion of having curricula and a society um, that begins to look like the people that are in it um, is forthcoming. And um, folks um, need to be prepared um, to, to accommodate that reality. I think a lot of people are kicking and screaming that reality. They can't take it, they can't take it as we've seen over the last four years. But, um, you know, before we leave the subject of affirmative action, uh, you know, the thing that really kind of continues to, to disturb me is the notion that affirmative action allows equal educational opportunity for less qualified students or less qualified employees if it's a, a, a job site, um, which is totally mythical, right? Because in fact, students of affirmative action or of, of, of job uh, equal opportunities have more skills than those that are going in, you know, the traditional way to, to college or jobs. They have cultural skills, they have language skills, they have skills that they bring from their their families that you cannot learn in school. Uh, you know, we don't hire students uh, from law school at, at our organization who have the best grades or may make law review or, or what have you, those traditional measures. We need people with compassion, empathy, who know how to serve people in their communities. Uh, and that's a, another thing that you don't learn in school. It's, it's something that you bring as an inherent skill from your families and your background. So to say that affirmative action is allowing underqualified uh, applicants into jobs and schools is just ridiculous. Right, and it, 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 it speaks to your values because a test score doesn't speak to what kind of values you have, what kind of empathy you bring, what your drive is, the kinds of things that make you um, a better person and a better professional. And what we've learned is over time, um, as you and I have grown in our careers, in the last 20 years, corporate America, the arts, literature, everybody is beginning to understand that a more diverse work environment is more interesting, it serves more people, and it's more creative. And we know this from the research on networks. We know that um, people of color have the least amount of networks into the power elite, but we also know that when they get there, that the dynamism of the places change. And so um, if you wanna be creative, if you wanna make money, if you wanna increase your customer base, if you want to be have schools that are more interesting and have a variety of discussions, you need to diversify. And, and as we know, this, this genie is not going back into the bottle because our demographics are telling us by 2028 and 2032, the number of white people in this country is going to be a minority, period. And so the, the standards of what we measure things against are changing. And we can see that in everything from makeup, hairstyles, music, art, um, you know, literature, sports, everything is going into a more diverse country. And um, those that don't like it are just gonna be mad and eventually die off. And those that embrace it are going to be more ready for the future. I think for a lot of people, it's not changing quick enough, James. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Get out there and make that change. I think that's what we're trying to encourage people to do today. Um, you know, when uh, we were coming up, 
in the Western edition. And I know the, the, the discussion about affirmative action is about us, you know, an introduction to you and I, but also um, uh, it really is a, a key part of racial justice in, in this country to provide equal educational opportunity. We need to provide uh, equal employment opportunities for folks. And uh, that was a key component of an effort to do that. And it's gone away. But when you and I were coming up uh, in the Western edition, um, you know, there was a very natural alliance between the Asian and African-American communities, especially in San Francisco. It seems like, I mean, you and I are from Southern California. And, you know, if you remember what the Crenshaw district used to look like in uh, other parts of LA, uh, similar to the Fillmore, where there was a political, economic, and, and historical reasons that Asian and African American communities were right in their own, in the same areas. Right? Um, and so there was a, a natural affinity, um, which kind of spoke to our office, you know, the office you and I worked in, uh, in the Western edition. Do you have any, any, uh, any thoughts about that, that natural connection? Yeah. And to me, what I always loved about it, one is the vibrancy, but two is what oppression brought. So the Western edition was a traditional Japanese community. And when World War II was declared against um, the empire of Japan, folks were put in, in concentration camps and black folks were brought out as economic opportunity for the war machine. So both different forms of oppression, um, Japanese folks were put in camps and black folks were put um, in neighborhoods that were segregated, but we wanted their labor. And then after the war, um, when Japanese folks came back to their homes and um, black folks were there, this was two communities that were finding a way through their oppressions to try to come together and understand each other culturally. And the vibrancy of that was just incredible. And when you look at that neighborhood now, it's been gentrified, it's basically all similar, and it's lost, in my opinion, a lot of the cultural diversity, a lot of the, the vibrancy that made it what it was, Japantown and the Fillmore coming together and celebrating together um, you know, um, during the Cherry Blossom Festival and Juneteenth is something that we lost and um, it, it's a tragedy. It is, it is a tragedy. It, it kind of uh, it has been repeated, it seems like, throughout the country where uh, there's been this displacement, usually at the hands of uh, some uh, public, so-called public good, like the, the redevelopment movement in San Francisco, which displaced both the African-American and American Japanese-American communities in the Western edition. And the result was the empty uh, buildings and the, 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 the empty fields of, of land where buildings used to stand. All that time that we worked at, at the Western Edition Law Office, um, we were surrounded by empty lots. I, I can still remember that. And for years, they stood empty because redevelopment decided all the, the poor income uh, Asians and African Americans had to go. And then they couldn't get it together in order to rebuild uh, moderate income housing. And even when they did rebuild the housing, none of, none of the folks could afford to move back into San Francisco. So the damage had already been done. But politically, um, I, I think there's a, it, it also kind of stands for it's symbolic of the, um, the, the, the affinity, the, the connection that we've had in the political civil rights, social justice movements of the, of the 60s and 70s. You know, there's no doubt that Asian Americans have benefited, have stood on the shoulders of the uh, civil rights uh, movement started by the Black American community in, in the 50s and 60s and, and, and 70s. And it was natural, I think, for us to be part of that movement, as, as you said, as oppressed people. Once you stick somebody in a concentration camp, I think you forever change a whole uh, 
group of, of people in America uh, and you change them uh, to be uh, very connected to the oppression that occurs even today uh, with the Black Lives, La Black Lives uh, Matter movement. So um, do you see that in, in the work that you're doing uh, with multiple uh, communities across the, the country? Yes, um, because as we've talked about, Dean, it is inevitable. So once it is that you understand about, you know, um, John Powell at, at Cal um, has the notion of othering and belonging. And once you understand that all those people that have been othered um, are been treated similar to you, maybe not exactly like you, as we've said, each ethnicity has its own journey, but all of the people of color in this country have been othered at one time or another, from the Chinese to the Filipinos, Latin, Latinos um, and uh, Native Americans and black folks, for sure brought here as enslaved people. And the question that we are always doing in this work that we are looking for is to go from how do we, move from being people that were othered into belonging? And how is it that the institutions and the systems built in this country um, are built for us to belong? And we're not going away. We're not going anywhere. And so either you create a vehicle for us to belong, or we're going to create one for ourselves, which is what the struggle in America is for every race and ethnicity. And each journey is different, but its path is the same way, is to be a, feel like they are a part of the fabric of the country that asked them to come or brought them here to contribute. And we are incredible contributors and we contribute better together. Sometimes we're on our own pathways, but we are going to be contributing. And so we are gonna move from othering to belonging and that is, I think, is the journey for the next generation. What does belonging look like for all of us? I think in the next segment, we'll, we will get further into what James is describing, the vehicle the pathway. Um, and we're going to take a short uh, pause right now. And we'll be back with you in just a minute. Welcome back to our conversation with James Bell, founder and president of the W. Hayward Burns Institute. James, I don't know if you saw those photos uh, that they put up on the slides, but one of them is us at an anti-Baki demonstration in front of the federal building in the, <laughs> in the late 70s. Yes. And I think you were yelling the loudest of anybody there. <laughs> And the other is is our staff participating in uh, the Black Lives Matter March in Oakland uh, last uh, last year. Mm -hmm. It was like so so long ago. Um, you know, we covered some historical perspectives, uh, but before we kind of move on to the present, I just wanted to say something that had been coming to my mind a lot, and that is to kind of acknowledge. Uh, the folks at the Western Edition Law Office that we worked at. Arnold C. Ellis uh, was kind of my legal mentor uh, who uh, kind of paved the way for, for my work uh, there and, and, and now. Um, and unfortunately, Arnold has passed. Um, and I also wanted to, to acknowledge Maddie Moss. I don't know if you remember Maddie, but uh, of course. Maddie was admin uh assistant at the office and she kind of was my life tutor uh because that matter was straight up telling me exactly what the honest and straight opinion was uh that she had of, of what was going on in life uh so i mean that those people um still are with me and uh and help my work do you do you have any 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 memories of those days yeah, so um, I started the uh, Hayward Burns Institute 20 years ago, and the Western Edition Law Office was the model of the culture that I wanted to create when I started 
my own nonprofit. I never thought that I would be able to do what it takes to start my own nonprofit. I run it like a small business, um, but um, to try to set the culture that we had at the Western Edition Law Office that, you know, I told, I would tell my staff, and this is what I loved about, um, that that was such an early work experience in my life, was that we may not be a family, but we're a community. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. as a community, we have to take care of each other. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we try to get rid of toxicity. We try to have direct communication with each other so that people aren't talking behind each other's back or clicks mm -hmm. in the office. And if I hadn't worked at the Western Edition Law Office, I didn't know that such a working environment was possible. We didn't have any clicks. Nobody talked behind each other's back. We had each other's back. If somebody was trying to get a brief out and needed help, people would step in. If somebody needed to run the city hall and get some papers and stuff, and it's like, while you're there, can you grab some stuff for me? And it was like, great. And every other day, not every day, because we'd have weighed 900 pounds, every day, Dean, every other day, you would bring in a pastry from the Japanese bakery, and we would all chow down on the pastry. And it was that kind of office. And um, it is the best working environment I've ever been in. And um, until I created the one that we have now where we strive to, to emulate um, that office. And I strive to be, although not being complete, I strive to be like Arnold was. Um, I never forget a time, this is an anecdote. So the office was on Fillmore and Geary. Um, in a bank. I don't know what it is now. I don't I don't know what it is now. I think it's a yeah. it's a sushi place or something now. But anyway, it was in an old bank and it was not far from my house. So I could take the the number five to the twenty-two and get right off the bus and get to work. So every one day a week, every lawyer had intake. And all the clients that came in that day, that was your intake day. And so I got there for my intake day and I was 10 minutes late and I walked in and I was like, hey, what's up, everybody? You know, OK, I'm ready for my first client. And before the first client came in, Arnold walked into my office and I had never seen Arnold like that. And he said, you are 10 minutes late. Don't you ever disrespect yourself. Don't disrespect our clients and don't disrespect your colleagues that have to make excuses for you as to why you're 10 minutes late. We are here to serve these people. Their time is valuable. And so I never want you to be late again. It's disrespectful to you and it's disrespectful to them. And I, I was just speechless. I said, okay, Arnold, I'll never be late again. And I was never late again. He didn't yell at me. He didn't scream at me. He just said, we are here to serve these people and don't mm -hmm. disrespect them. And I will mm -hmm. never ever forget that lesson. And it is something that I hopefully have taken with me to the organization that I run now. So the Western Edition Law Office is huge in my professional life. And um, I am so glad it was really one of the first offices I worked in. Yeah, I wish he would have yelled at me about that. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, well, you as we move forward, oh, no, <laughs> that's not true, James. You know that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward, you know, the killing of innocent Black Americans like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd seemed to have woke up America all of a sudden. Um, at least for a couple of months, people were paying attention. I'm not sure how long the interest is going to last, but... Uh, you know, they kind of became aware that this country has a history of violence against people of color. And it started with the, you know, as far back as the genocide of native and indigenous people in this country. Um, we need to continue our efforts that somehow have penetrated the more general public. Um, what are your thoughts about, and we, and we talked last segment about different vehicles and different pathways i mean what are your thoughts on on how we progress from here you talk nationally to young people and to 
uh, all, all types of organizations. Uh, what's your sense of it? So that's, that's a really interesting question, Dean. So my sense of it is that the notion of what our society has been willing to do in the name of safety is increasingly becoming delegitimized and bankrupt. And young people see it for what it is and they have not bought into the myth that the only way for us to be kept safe is to have custody, control, suppression, and domination of people. Because we know that those people that are the purveyors of that kind of violence don't do that with their own kids. When their kids need something, they get them as much help as possible. It's just when it's other people's kids that they treat like trash. And so for me, I think you know, the biggest step is that young people understand that the institutions of justice just don't work. They may not know the data. They may not know that the recidivism rate is at 65%. They may not know that it costs in San Francisco $230,000 to put somebody up at juvenile hall um, for a month. They may not know those numbers, but they know that there's nothing good in the way that we are doing justice. And what I believe is happening and that I am totally in support of is young people um, haven't, they aren't as experienced and they haven't been around as much as those of us who are older, but they also realize that by organizing, they can make a difference. They know that people sitting around tables talking about policy is not going to make a difference. It is organizing and it is being heard and it is challenging those people that are um, that are in power to say, this is not sustainable. You cannot keep sending cops into our neighborhoods and beating us down and expecting this to work as a way that we um, um, become a community. And so once they no longer buy that myth, they don't buy that hype, they're like, so how can we do this differently? What might work differently rather than calling 911 and bringing a SWAT team out here? Because that doesn't work. It's not like the shootings have reduced as a result of that. And so what I what 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 people are doing is understanding that these institutions that have supposed to deliver us safety and community well-being are not doing it and we and they can't convince us that they're doing it and young people are trying to explore different ways to do it they're young they don't quite know but they know what doesn't work and what they're saying is this don't work and we need to think of something else and that to me makes me eminently hopeful and we see it happening. We see people saying, why are we calling the police when somebody has a mental health problem? Why don't we call somebody that's a mental health specialist? Why do we call the police if somebody's homeless? What can the police do? The police can't buy them a home. Why do we call them the police for that? Maybe we should be able to house them and have some kind of services for them. So it's these opening questions that I think are the are, is the journey for the new generation, and I see um, that that actually those conversations are um, starting to be had, and I'll just speak for me. But the younger people today have a much more sophisticated power analysis than we did when we were coming up, and so oh, yeah. I appreciate that power analysis that they have because make no mistake about it. What happens in our communities and the decisions that people make downtown about us is all about power and understanding where they get their power and how their power can be threatened is extremely important. And I think these young folks are all about it. 
I'm 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 inspired by you being so hopeful, um, and I think you're right that uh, our future is with the young people. And in a few seconds, uh, we're going to uh, ask uh, Queenie and Thomas to join us, um, two members of our Youth Advisory Council, and uh, they have their own questions. I also want to remind viewers that uh, you're welcome to text in your um, in the chat, text in your questions for James, um, uh, and we'll try to address them uh, live. Um, Queenie and, and, and Thomas, uh, please feel free to, to bring in your questions. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to, to add now? Go ahead, Thomas. Uh, hi, James. Hi, Dean. First of all, I'm really inspired by both of you. Um, so the first question that Queenie, Queenie and I came up with is, what are sort of the changes you're seeing in youth POC solidarity movements um, now, the solidarity um, of our elders? So if I understood the question, Thomas, it is, what, what's, what solidarity am I seeing among youth in in um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color movement. Yes. Yeah. So, sort of, how has it evolved over time, and what are youth doing now differently that maybe um, you know our elders did differently? Right. So it's 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 very interesting. Um, so to me, I think that our leadership um, back in the day was much more hierarchical. And I'd have to say that basically, um, in terms of um, LGBTQ issues, they were kind of like not spoken. Now there were gay people in the movement, but it wasn't like they were identified as having their own movement in the movement, you know, kind of thing. And so ours was very hierarchical. The leader was the leader. You know what I mean? It was just like Huey Newton was the leader of the Black Panther Party, and Huey Newton was the leader, and everybody else kind of responded to that. And you know, I have. Um, friends that started Black Lives Matter. So Patricia Cullors and Alicia Garza are friends of mine um, and um, I'm in touch with them all the time. And the thing that gets me the most about them is how decentralized they are. So movements today with social media, which I'm not on because I'm old, um, um, there's no way that you can keep centralized movements with social media. Everybody can do everything everywhere. And so to mm -hmm. me, what is happening, and I love the solidarity, is how people are being decentralized, but they are still organizing around ways. And so in the Bay Area, the organizing may be very different than it is in LA. And it may be very different than it is in Stockton and Fresno. But folk in Stockton and Fresno are still organizing. There are ways to be in touch. And so I think that young people a much more decentralized in terms of who makes the call, who's in authority, who says this is what we're going to do, what we put our name on, um, than we were. And so, you know, I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, in some way, I believe in this kind of centralized hierarchy because I'm like, well, what are we doing? And what do they say we're doing? And in another way, it's just ridiculous because if the leader is stupid, then that is that doesn't make any sense either. And so I just think that um, you know, this whole decentralized way of organizing is something that we as older people can learn from the younger people. But also what I also say to younger people is, y'all ain't been around but 20 years. There's a lot of stuff that we know that we can help with. And so what I believe is important is that the elders and the young people work um, co collectively, that we work in this way that is equitably and that we all help each other. Um, in this way. So um, um, that is what I see, is that we can say, don't make the mistakes we made, but young people can say, but yeah, the way you guys did it ain't exactly working now. We should do it this way. And I think that that's what we, I think that's how we're best effective. Queenie, did you want to add a question for James? 
Yeah, um, echoing Thomas. Um, hi, Dean. Hi, James. It's really nice to be able to talk to you both today. Um, so the second question that we have kind of following that is, um, how have the wedge issues that are meant to split solidarity efforts um, evolved over time? And what is the climate of wedge issues um, in the Black and the API youth communities today? Dean, I don't want to do all the talking. Did you want to take that or you sure, want me to you, take that? You do all the talking, James. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I think that the, the wedge issues are those issues in terms of whose struggle is whose struggle, meaning are we all a part of each other's struggle? And so I think it is, you know, this whole notion of who you know the oppression olympics who is more oppressed than whom where do you live what what do you have and that can be not only um between ethnicities that can be intra um ethnic um you know kind of beef and so my sense is this is that it should not be a it the question should not be prove to us how down you are with our struggle or are, is our struggle your struggle? I think, then this is where I think elders can be helpful to young people, is that what are our values? What do we believe? If we have the same values, right? If we believe that people should all have a place to live, if we believe that every child matters and should get a quality education, if those are the values that we believe in, then we are all each other's struggle. And so it doesn't matter who's down with whom, it is do we have these values and how is it that we best support each other to have these values? And I just think that, that is, um, that's where we start because it's so easy to find ways in which we're different. In the previous segment, I talked about othering and belonging. And I think that every time anybody in a movement, in a solidarity movement, begins to other people, then you are essentially, um, you are, sorry, you are essentially um, copying what those in power do. And so I just think that we have to make sure we don't other, and then to say, how do we get people to belong? How is it that we get folks to belong? And I'll give you a specific example. The work I do is to try to deconstruct the justice apparatus. And those are the most entrenched institutions in our country because they are made, they were created to protect the haves from the have nots. So we deal with law enforcement, we deal with probation, we deal with district attorneys. I mean, we deal with the, the tip of the spear of social control. Now, when we deconstruct those places, who are many of the places, I'm sorry, excuse me, who are many of the people that have those jobs? They're people of color. If you're gonna deconstruct a bureaucracy in San Francisco, you're going to be engaging with Filipinos. Why? Because government couldn't discriminate. So how could somebody that was Filipino get a job in the Department of Real Estate in the city and county of San Francisco? Because they couldn't be discriminated against, whereas the private en um, em enterprises could. Who works up at the jail, 850 Bryant Street? A lot of them are black and brown people because they didn't get discriminated against. So here's what I mean by values. So while I'm trying to deconstruct the systems that these black and brown and native people and Asian people work in, I also have to understand that they are black and brown middle class. They want those jobs. They've sent their kids to college on those jobs. Those jobs have pensions. They're in SEIU, they're in unions. And so the question is, what are the values that we can agree upon in order to say that we shouldn't be brutalizing people in order to keep them safe? 
And I'm sure that you didn't take those jobs to be heartless, thoughtless bureaucracies. You took those jobs to, to, to better your family, to better yourself. And so the question is, how do we interact with labor to deconstruct a system that is oppressive? And how do you have those conversations with them so that they say, yeah, I didn't get in this job to be oppressive, but I damn sure got in this job to buy a house and send my kids to college. So how, what is our values that we can meet on that street? Thomas and Queenie, you know, um, those are amazing questions. I, I don't think from our point of view that that much has changed with young people and uh, uh, organizing work and collaborations. Um, but things are working against you. Uh, we have a, a more segregated society today. You know, we've segregated our schools. We're segregating our housing. Uh, there's not as much opportunity for cross-cultural connections. You have to really go out of your way to make those connections. Whereas, you know, uh, back in the day, it was all about the neighborhood and the neighborhood was diverse. It's very difficult to find those diverse neighborhoods in the Bay Area because of the cost of living yeah. uh, and because of, of predatory lending and things like that. Um, but uh, uh, I think the other pressure that seems to be put on young people today is just the level of competition. We've always had to compete for the few crumbs, as people always said, right? There's a few jobs, a few opportunities, a few slots in law school, in med school. Uh, at, at, at UC or whatever. And it's always the people of color that have to fight for those crumbs. And you all are in such a pressure cooker of competition, uh, much more so than I think James and I were in terms of yep. getting good grades, getting out of high school, getting, getting into the right high school so that you can get into the right college. And those things pit us against each other. So we have to kind of work against that type of mentality we, where it's not about competing with each other or other races or other ethnicities. It's about the values that James is talking about. What are the values that we have in common? And let's work from those values. Um, there's a question from the audience, uh, James. Uh, the current debate over the defund po the police movement uh, is supported by a large number of youth of color, <clears throat> but it's causing conflict within the progressive kind of movements uh, over its effectiveness in addressing racial justice issues. Does the slogan matter, defund the police? How can young people address conflicts within the movement and still work together? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, it is something that's been, um, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book and the section that I'm writing now is on um, law enforcement and the police and prosecutors. And so I appreciate this question. So any slogan is just made out of frustration and oftentimes aspiration. It is not a blueprint. And so when people say defund the police, they mean defund the worst elements of custody control and suppression and treating our communities like an armed camp. It does not mean we don't want any kind of policing. And so what happens is, is that people take the sentiment and they distort it because Police have been around since the 1830s in the United States publicly and privately, if you've heard of Wells Fargo, if you've heard of Brinks, and if you've heard of Pinkerton, those were all the private police before the governments created police departments in the 1830s. And so there's always been some sense of we need community safety. The question that defund the police begs is, is the current structure that is supposed to deliver us safety delivering on what it's supposed to do? And what they're saying by defund the police is, no, 
It's not delivering us safety. It's only delivering us suppression and domination. And it invites the question, if you want to hear it, it invites the question, and if we don't like what we have now, what can we imagine as to how to do it differently? And I think about the same question as aspirational. When Tanahishi Coates, in the Atlantic Monthly article calling for reparations for Black people, when he wrote that article about why Black people should have reparations, you would have thought that he just screamed and yelled and was saying the most ridiculous stuff on the planet. He was just suggesting it as an idea. People took it, twisted it, said, why are we going to pay Black people money? I wasn't around. All the arguments you hear about it. And then what you begin to hear now is some cities are actually taking that question seriously. It's like now that we've learned more. And so this question of defund the police is just an invitation, like Black Lives Matter, to actually start a conversation about the way it's being done, in, done now is unacceptable to us, and it invites a conversation of how we would do it differently. And that, so that's, to me, what those slogans are. And once again, to go from other to belonging, to say, OK, whether I agree with that slogan or not, let's talk about what we would what would we create as an alternative to the police the way we know it now. Thomas, uh, Queenie, I wanted to give you an opportunity to um, ask some final questions. Anything else that you would like to, to bring up? Just a one last question. Um, what are maybe some of the most memorable or notable moments um, and struggles from your participation um, in liberation movements as well as your careers? And do you have any further advice for you know, future generations of activists like Queenie and I? Wow. I'll, I'll tell one. you real quick. I was involved in, I was involved in, as was Dean, um, in anti-apartheid work. And it just seemed so impossible when Nelson Mandela was locked up for 27 years, the white minority government in South Africa was in control of everything and they had worldwide support. I just never thought that those little demonstrations we had down Market Street and asking the University of California to defund their investments in South Africa. When I saw Nelson Mandela walk out of jail, I just couldn't, I just couldn't believe how these small efforts amounted to something. And um, the other thing quickly is when I got to meet, you know, Fred Korematsu and people who were in concentration camps who sought and got legal redress for what this government did to them to meet that gentle, tiny man who was so dignified and so powerful was a moment for me as well. Thank you, everybody. I think we're just about out of time. Before we 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 uh, we leave, uh, I wanted to make sure that we understood the significant and fantastic work that James Bell is doing with the W. Hayward Burns Institute. James, if you want to uh, recap, I know that you're reworking uh, Youth Guidance Center uh, in San Francisco to do away with the antiquated uh, juvenile justice system. And I understand that you're also going to take over the Los Angeles County uh, system and do the same type of work there. Uh, do you have a few words to, to describe the, the impact of that work? Sure, quickly, because of young people organizing, they forced, the, they forced the, over five years, not instantly, the Board of Supervisors in Los Angeles to totally redesign their probation department. They said the probation department was using pepper spray and that they just weren't getting the kind of results. They asked us to redesign it. And with young people and community folks, we've come up with a, a design that is humane, that is restorative and not punitive. For the largest probation department in the country, a $500 million department with 3,500 employees. And similarly in San Francisco, 
the Board of Supervisors here. I invite everybody to follow what's going to go on between now and December next year. We're, San Francisco is going to be the first city in the country to close their juvenile detention facility, um, not to relocate it, not to close it and open up something else, but to literally close it so that when kids get, get picked up, they'll no longer be taken to juvenile hall. And we are creating a whole new way um, of, of where and how we deal with young people. And that will be done by December of next year. So I invite you to keep track of what we're doing um, and, and lend your voice. Join the process of what's happening. And so both of these are history making and very innovative things that we're doing. Um, and as a result of, of people getting together and asking for a new way of being. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and through our series of conversations. Uh, please check out our, um, our website. Um, you can view recordings of the three conversations um, through our website links. Uh, I want to thank all of our sponsors and supporters. Uh, we still have a few weeks before the end of the year that you can, uh, you can pull a donation for uh, API Legal Outreach or even the W. Hayward Burns Institute. Um, and uh, uh, help support the, the, the work we're trying to do. James, uh, it, it's, it's great to, to, to hear from you, to see you, understand that you're writing memoirs or something. Are we gonna see that on Amazon or what, what's happening with that? We'll see, it'll happen next year if it happens. Okay, <laughs> thank you to uh, uh, Queenie and uh, uh, Thomas for, for their participation. I wanna thank, uh, the Tiny Cast Company, uh, Felicia and, and Scott, for their expert production. Um, we're going to possibly continue some conversations in the near future due to popular demand, but we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens with, uh, with uh, viewer interest. We want to ask you all to stay healthy and safe during the holidays, uh, but to enjoy the holiday season as much as you can. And thanks again for joining us. Good night.